Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. I'm Daniel Isengard, and in the spring semester of 2021 at NYU School of Professional Studies, I'm offering a course on the rich history of the cabaret. Life is a cabaret. In this eight session course, we will look at where it came from, what it was, and what it became. We'll look at vintage photographs, excerpts of movies, read transcripts of plays and skits that were written for the cabaret, listen to songs performed in the cabarets, and figure out how the cabaret is still alive in our contemporary world. But for now, let me just give you a short glimpse into what we will be looking at. Now, what is a cabaret? It's obviously a French word, and in much of the 19th century, it merely stood for a kind of tavern, a place where you could go, have a drink, have some wine, maybe with friends, and occasionally there would be some kind of life entertainment happening on the side, merely to attract customers. And then something happened, something that would change the meaning of the word cabaret forever. And it happened in the neighborhood of Montmartre in Paris in the late 19th century. Montmartre had not been sanitized like many other neighborhoods in Paris. And in Montmartre lived a vibrant mix of people from the demi-monde, the outcasts, the outlaws, and the new, free, uh, the new breed, the new tribe of Montmartre, the Bohemians. Artists, painters, writers, composers, musicians, dancers, singers, mingling with the pimps and prostitutes, living in poverty perhaps, but always idealistic, just like the protagonists in the famous opera, La Bohème. And out of this vibrant mix emerged the first artistic cabarets, les cabarets artistiques. These were places where they could all come together socialize, drink, hang out into the wee hours, and most importantly, entertain each other. The idea was to rattle the cage of social norms, to make fun of the world and of each other, free from tradition, free from bourgeois values and commercial aspirations. The idea was to entertain each other with skits and songs, and little plays, and to make each other laugh, and to make each other think. It was never about being sentimental or pretty. It was about being frivolous, revolutionary, libertarian, and most importantly, very interactive. The early cabarets laid the groundwork for modern life entertaining. Now, for example, one of the things that was institutionalized, if not invented in the early cabarets was the breaking of the fourth wall by the compere, the master of ceremonies. Here we see Rodolphe Salis, the owner of the Chat Noir, and Aristide Briand, famously painted by Toulouse-Lautrec. Both of them talked directly to the audience, and Aristide Briand was famous for talking down to the audience. He was pretty rough with the audience. You could argue that insult comedy was invented right then and there. Another element that was new at the time was a new style of singing, most famously by Yvette Gilbert, also drawn by Toulouse-Lautrec, a very popular singer of the time. Now, she was not classically trained in the bel canto technique. She didn't know how to really project the voice, but she found a style that solved the problem. She basically melodically spoke the songs. And that created the term diseuse as opposed to a chanteuse. She would speak the song, a style that became wildly popular and widespread once the microphone was introduced most famously then put to good use 
by Marlena Dietrich, or much later, Juliette Gréco, La Diseuse. It also invited in the amateur, the amateur in the best sense, someone who was not traditionally trained in the academy and felt that he had a place on the stage nevertheless. Now at the Chat Noir, one of the earliest cabarets in Paris, the most innovative new element that was wildly popular was the shadow plays, a precursor to motion pictures. One of the things that made it really very popular was it enabled a lot of artistic freedom to its creators. They could show things you could have never shown with real actors. Most importantly, the exotic, and the erotic, two key elements that would define the content of the cabarets in much of the 20th century. The early cabarets in Paris became so popular that they spawned a wave, a trend across Europe. Every major city wanted to now in the early 20th century have its own cabarets. In Berlin, you had the Bunte Theater, the Motley Theater. In Vienna, you had the Cabaret Fledermaus, the Bat Cabaret. In Munich, the Elf Scharfrichter, the 11 Executioners. And in Barcelona, El Quatre Guts, the Four Cats. All of them try to straddle this thin line between being artistically free and commercially viable and still adhere to the authorities that continue to threaten them with a shutdown because of morality laws and censorship. They did not have an easy time. One cabaret that stands out a little bit later in the midst of World War I was the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich. Zurich had become the grand central of intellectual emigres that had fled the war zones. They came together in neutral Switzerland, and among them was a group of radical thinkers and artists who created this cabaret that was the birthplace of surrealism and Dada, a reaction to the catastrophic World War I in which all social norms had completely collapsed. Now, logically, the performances at Voltaire were radical. They deconstructed language, they were deliberately chaotic, non-narrative, provocative. They deconstructed language. They created costumes that made the protagonists look like a mix between robots and animals. And you could argue that they invented performance art for better or for worse. Now, of course, everybody knows that the cabaret found its apotheosis era in Berlin, in the era of the Weimar Republic, Germany's failed prototype for a democratic republic. World War I was over, and suddenly there was this new hunger for life, a hunger for excess. It seemed as if the entire city turned into a cabaret. Here, life was a cabaret. You danced on the volcano, the volcano of danger, the danger of the past that nobody wanted to talk about and the danger of the present as the stock market crashed and you did everything you could to still live it up and find out your deepest urges and live them out in the vibrant electrified nightlife and all of it to the beat of the exciting new import from America jazz. It was an artistic free-for-all that ended in a political free-for-all. 1933, the Nazis took over. Game over. But of course, the cabaret didn't die. It merely morphed. It went underground. It changed. It adapted. It was sanitized, reinvented, appropriated. We see it resurfacing throughout history in waves, commercialized, marginalized, stand-up comedy, pop music, 
music videos, Hollywood, late night TV shows. And of course, again, the amateurs stepped in, people who got famous in television and thought it would be kind of hip to do a cabaret show, singing standards. Cabaret is still alive and well if you look for it, which is what we're going to do in our class. I hope you'll join me for the cabaret. For now, to Lou.